I'm on a journey to get better, and I want to do it with you. And I'm not just focusing on physical health. I'm focusing on everything, emotional wellness, spirituality, finances, relationships, and so much more. Every week, it will be my personal goal to bring us, the world's leading healers, experts, and game changers, to share groundbreaking secrets and tips to getting better in all areas of life. Getting better isn't easy, but it's a whole lot easier when we can do it together. Welcome to Better Together with me, Maria Menounos. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together, because when you know better, you get better. It is May 12th, 2020, our quote of the day. Many people will walk in and out of your life, but only true friends will leave footprints apart. Oh, I love that the first awe is from Stephen Lemieux. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for joining us. We have a, a great show for you today, especially if you're a Friends fan. Ooh, ooh, we've got one of the biggest, most influential uh, producer directors in the world of sitcom, Kevin Bright, is going to be with us to answer all of our burning Friends questions. And uh, for that discussion, I have brought in friend super fan, AfterBuzz TV host, and gosh, she has a very long resume that I don't happen to have in front of me, but um, I'm sure Roxy can share all of the amazing platforms she is hosting on right now. Uh, Roxy Stryer is joining us today. Hi, Roxy. It's because I've been with you 10 years. My whole resume is you. (laughs) (laughs) Just should say Maria Menounos underneath. Uh, I am freaking out today, Maria. I am freaking out i i don't want to take the number one spot but i don't know a bigger friends fan than me i feel like i'm the president of the fan club this is a huge moment a huge day for me i die i die meanwhile jeff uh jeff graham are you a friends fan love friends yeah it's funny i um surprisingly didn't get into the show until 2013 uh, but as you may or may not know, I worked on a ship for six months. And um, so the only TV we could watch was like old seasons of television. Mm-hmm. And I binged the whole thing. And I feel like I was resistant. Like I was like, I don't want to like be one of those like friends people. And of course, by the end, I was in love with it. That's so funny. So yeah. did you guys, because you, you're young. So this was before you, like this was when you were little. So when did you start watching Friends? I must have been maybe seven years old. Um, I, I was young, but my mom put them all on VHS. You know how you could record things on VHS? Uh-huh. So she was always watching. And by the time she felt like I was old enough to watch, but I, I think it was around seven. Seven. I, <laughs> I binged. I binged through the VHSs. I don't even think that was a term at the time, uh, but that's what we did. And then once I got to be on the live schedule, nobody could mess with me. It was the show. Steven, did you watch Friends? I watched it when it was on, like on TV. Okay. Like I would catch it if it was ever on TV. And then if it was not on TV, I wouldn't like seek it out. So it was part of NBC's must see TV. And I remember I didn't watch must see TV and I didn't watch really any TV. I was busy trying to like make it in life. And so I missed all of that. I missed Seinfeld. I missed Friends. I mean, I've missed everything, I feel like, until the last 10 years. The last 10 years is when I've started watching TV um, with Breaking Bad and Jersey Shore and all of that. So before that, I think I only watched when I was really young. And when I was really young, I watched like Knight Rider and Lassie and Flipper and, Mm. um, you know, Charles in Charge and Growing Pains and all those kind of shows. And then that after that, I was like, there was no TV. So I missed that whole middle window of like brilliance. And uh, it's so funny, Marina, because you started after Buzz TV and I've never asked you about that, but I just figured you were always a diehard TV. What made you kind of come back to life after there was a big gap? Kevin. (laughs) Kevin is a diehard TV fan. Uh, Kevin taught me how to eat popcorn at movies. We were too poor to go to movies or forget order popcorn. So Kevin taught me a lot of things. He taught me how to um, splurge at the movies, like you're a gajillionaire and buy all the candy and popcorn you want. And uh, yeah, we really got into TV together. So um, I, uh, and I think I got in at the right time because really I'm excellence in TV has really just exploded in the last 
10 years. But Friends, I will admit, I, like I said, I never watched it. And so whenever I interviewed Jennifer Aniston or Matt LeBlanc or any of them, I had no frame of reference for anything that they had done that everybody was obsessed with them for. Um, you know, Courtney Cox, I was interviewing her for her new shows and things like that. Um, but it's, it's so interesting. I started watching it maybe like a year ago or so on a plane. And my friend Dimitri is psychotically obsessed. And when he came to this country from Greece, he just started binging it. We would be at wrestling like events, whether it was, you know, WrestleMania or whatever. And he would be in the dressing room just watching Friends on repeat. And he's like, my love, Friends is amazing. I love it. And I just started catching it on a plane and started getting hooked and then started buying all the seasons on my iPad because the two episodes or three episodes that were available on the plane weren't enough for me. And so I'm still early in my journey. I'm only a couple seasons down, I think. But it is incredible how it still holds up. And it's they're so good at what they do. And they're so lovable and fun. It's yeah. crazy. I have to ask you the the friends question, Maria. Oh, who would you be? Yeah, I, yeah. Who are you? <laughs> I need to know. I've got ideas. Oh man, uh, I feel like I would be a combination of all three girls. Yeah, you kind of are like that that blend of all of them. Monica meets Rachel meets Phoebe. Yeah, meets Maria. That's what I think. What did you think? I I kind of see that. Well, it's you love to cook, so that's obviously Monica. So yeah. you've got that in you. Um. And then you're a little zany, like Phoebe. You've mm -hmm. got some quirks. I guess less Rachel. She's more spoiled, but she also becomes like the every girl. So that aspect of her works for you. Um, yeah, you kind of are the combo. I think I see Monica when I think about it. And um, just because <laughs> I feel like, and that's I'm a so controlling. I love Monica. <laughs> um, but like, I think the very hardworking, ambitious, um, you know, and even like the fam, like close to your, complicated in a good way relationship with your parents. Oh, I just knocked my webcam. But you know, it's, I think what's great about Friends is you can see yourself in every character a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I unfortunately sometimes feel like I'm Ross. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you think, Ross, but he's sort of the one that people roll their eyes at. And I think I see a lot of myself in Ross. You have no. a Chandler in you too. Don't, don't sell <laughs> yourself short. You're a Ross Chandler duo. Okay, that's, that's good. so funny. Okay, Roxy, who are you? In the, you know, this has been the lifelong question. I, I actually think I, you're the most Monica of all of them. Really? Yeah. I feel, I feel like I am a Monica Phoebe duo. That's, I that's do my not see Phoebe. Really? I feel like I say strange things sometimes that leave rooms kind of quiet. Like I'll, no. I'll drop a, a, a thing of my history and everybody's like, oh, hey, that crazy lady over okay, there. Okay, no, you have crazy stories, absolutely. But so I think Monica. I think it would be like Monica before she became Monica, where she was like now mature and had her shit together. I think Monica might have had a past where she was like a crazy balls out party like animal. And then she reformed and now she's very controlled. <laughs> yeah, I'm in between phases of Monica. I yeah. Like that. Yeah. I, like I don't that. see Phoebe. No, you're too like you you are too serious to be a kook. <laughs> That's kind of true. I think it's so funny how we see ourselves versus how the world sees us. Because yeah. in my mind, I'm I'm not serious, but you're so right. Everybody I know thinks I'm this very serious person. Don't you guys think? I mean, listen, these these two gentlemen know you very well as well. So, Stephen, Jeff, thoughts? Uh, are we allowed to plead the fifth? <laughs> <laughs> you it's can be trap. honest. Come on. I've uh, always thought of Roxy as such a Monica. I've told you that, Roxy. And part mm -hmm. of it's too, Monica and Ross are so, um, like, identifiably Jewish. And that's a part of you as well. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. I, I, I didn't mean, even know that. Is, yeah. The Gellers to me are the heart of friends. Like I love Ross and Monica because me, like that was what um that's what really pulled me into the show. But that's what is so special about friends is not only the fact that all six of those characters are just cultural references. Say one of them, people know exactly what you mean what you're talking about. That's so rare in television. 
and the fact that everyone has a different way in. Some people, it's Phoebe's jokes. For some people, it's Rachel and Ross. For some people, it's Monica. It's Chandler and Monica. Like, there's so many love that show. Wait, you guys, people in the chat are going crazy. They're saying, I have some Janice in me. Who is it's just your laugh. Who was Janice? I forget. Was she the first wife of, of Ross? No, she, or the Janice mom? is the one that uh, dated Chandler that sounded like, ah. oh my that's, God. That, that was the laugh. So that's the only reason why I think. Oh, that's uh, so great. Okay. Steven's pulling up a clip. Oh, I remember Janice. Yes. Oh my God. She, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Okay. But people are like, People are trying to figure out who everybody is. So, Stephen, you can get rid of that now so I can go back to reading the chat um, now that I have these great monitors. I so, think- Larry says this definitely deserves a thousand likes. Thank you, Larry. Uh, ben is saying first. I don't know what that means. First comment of oh, the first show. Comment. Yeah. Got it. Um, Roxy, don't mention how long it took you to make the Friends Lego set. Oh, so hard I to read. A, My eyes are blurry. I, I built a very expensive friends lego set that i think probably taken a child a couple of hours and took 25 hours to i i am not very building legos but now i have all of central perk big set what there's a guitar where and in, i it's over there it's in the corner i like display it in my Stop apartment it. i built a whole lego set yeah oh we need a picture of this for our social media okay i'll go, I'll go grab it for you steven do you know who you are um i think i'm joey yeah, I think I'm I think I say some really dumb stuff, but I might be kind of smart and talented at the same time. But Joey's like kind of just always says faux pas and it's always like awkward situations based on the thing he says, but it's never like from a malicious place. But okay. I have a little bit of Ross in me too, I got to say. And Chandler, right? I've like Chandler. Chandler's like I've so serious. Do you I think feel it's like, like- a little snarky yeah no, i see chandler i don't see joey at all ouch i don't no, see joey <laughs> at all i love chandler um i think but steven that like sort of snarky wit that's like very chandler and i mean that as a compliment i i mean rox what do you think yeah Christina? roxy who is steven yeah roxy who am i rip me to shreds well I'm just i think that when steven lemieux a boy in his 20s started i think he had more joey elements to him he did um, interesting okay and and I think we had to nip some of the Joey in the bud. And then I think that he his Ross really shined. <laughs> and then as he got more comfortable with himself, I feel like we got some Chandler in there. So he kind of went through the phases as well. I'm just imagining like the caveman evolutionary chart. And it's like the, oh my God, Roxy, that's amazing. Um, so I'm trying to read these, uh, these comments. And I, I realize I have a monitor even closer to me. So they're saying Maria, that- do you see what Roxy's holding up right now? Oh my God, no way. That's the friend set and you made yeah. that? I built it. It's got, it's got. Wait, perk. It's wait got was couch. this like a kit that came ready and you had to like, it's like a Lego by number? Yeah, Legos. It, yeah, Lego. It just came with a. This is what, like this. When did you and do then this? It came in a bajillion pieces. I started doing it on one of my live streams. Every, During uh, quarantine? Of, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> this and is I'm great. obsessed. And I've been playing my friends' games, too. I have, like, a whole friends' corner in my place. I've got this ball game. This one. It's oh, just, like, all of my, my. my friends' stuff. Um, if you guys so think much. Roxy is uh, borderline creepy, you can let us know in the chat. Um, <laughs> so is that AJ? Is that what it says, that he says that's amazing? AJ blows. Okay. Um and yeah, everybody's saying Chandler for Steven. Okay, I'll take Chandler. I'm I'm yeah. down with uh I'm down with the Chand. Okay. Everyone would take Chandler. Chandler's the best. Are I don't, you kidding me? I don't me? know that I'm the worst person to play this with. I, I don't have know it to well say enough. I feel like Chandler is the like he's my last place on the show. He Thank you. He bores me the most. <laughs> wow. Like everybody really? else is so um multi kind of not that they're multifaceted like they are all kind of who they are but like joey comes in no you you are chandler because you're very like serious slash angry sometimes and you come in and you throw your quip and then you're you grunt and get out and that's kind of chandler 
<laughs> Guys, I'm Chandler. I think I am actually. You are Chandler. But isn't it so funny that we want to believe we're like cute, sweet Joey? Maybe deep down inside there's cute, sweet Joey and you've repressed him and you've held him down and you like became Chandler. Maybe, maybe. like maybe two drinks in I become Joey. I think so. <laughs> actually, I've seen you two drinks in like at the Christmas party and you are. You're so like, ah. So. You should funny. always have a couple of drinks. Is that the lesson here? I mean, I get drinks least and I'm that really way. Phoebe. No, I I'm will... like a psycho. The funniest thing, Maria, <laughs> is one of the most common notes that I give hosts when we're doing teleprompter work is act like you're two drinks in because people mm. just get so much more loose and they become they become the joey version of themselves yeah i think that's what it is wow it's really fun okay so since we're doing this, who is kevin the i don't want to do him this justice <laughs> right now is kevin cause... ross meets chandler uh, that's what i think i think so yeah because Ross can be a little depressive, right? Sensitive. Yeah. And yeah. that's where I identify with Ross. is sort of like the sensitive brute artist. Like, I don't like... Jeff, you, you are so not. You are so not that. You are bright, sunshine, positive, like can do. You are... You see that. I... There's a there's a Kevin side of me that I identify with him that can be a little broody and like writer you know? Um, like and that's, a quarter that's of Kevin? a percent. Just like <laughs> I wore, I wore a dark gray cardigan today to tie into my broody side. Oh my god! Yeah. Well, I think the part of Ross that I see, Jeff, and the part that is different than Kevin is like the geology. The I love, I love rocks and dinosaurs and nerdy things, um, and I'm passionate about it. And I don't care. That's the you part of Ross. Yeah. But no, the thing that you think you are with the brooding, I, I don't <laughs> think I could see your face brood. Like, what would a brute even look uh, like on you? Never. You have to ask Laura. You have to ask her. Uh, she gets it. Yeah, See, she gets it. So, but... so there are those of us who, like, show the world all of our smiles, and then we come home and just roar to our partners. <laughs> I used girl, to be I'm like that. Hmm? I feel like I can be sensitive with her. I don't, know if, I don't know if you and Kevin relate to that at all, but I feel like I can get criticism from a boss or manager, and it doesn't bug me, but if I get criticism, I'm learning to get better at that in our marriage, but that's the Rossi part of me. Nice. I'm okay. such the opposite. If I get criticism from like a partner, I'm just like, <laughs> if I get criticism from Kevin and Marie, I'm just like, ruins my day. I'm like, oh no, I got to fix this. <laughs> well, I think when people know you really, really well, that's going to hurt the most, right? Because mm -hmm. you can, you can allow for, room when somebody else doesn't know you that well be like oh they don't really know me but when someone really knows you and they're hitting that target you're like shit now i can't escape <laughs> yeah i think it's also when you want to be somebody when you when it's not just a friend when you respect them because you would like to be in a position similar to theirs in life at some point then it really affects you because you take their advice more seriously as opposed to somebody who just knows you but is is not uh what you wouldn't take advice from them because you don't want to end up brought to them uh, or it's if you're on the same life like if you're on the same path like i feel like if if we're all in a car i'm not gonna and we're all in a car together i'm not gonna take directions from somebody in the car next to me who doesn't know as much like i'd rather take it from somebody who lives in the area right yeah so success is the same way like i'm not gonna go to jeff and get investment advice Right. I'm going to go to somebody yeah. who knows investments and I'm going to get advice from them. So if Jeff gives me advice unwarranted, I'm going to be like, Jeff, thank you. But I'm going to get it from someone. Totally. Totally. So interesting. I, um, I didn't know we were going to get into the who are you conversation for Roxy. That was a great initiation in there. Um, I think it's uh, important. It, you know <laughs> what? It really is. I think, you know, friends is is like cemented in pop culture. And I think. It will never, ever, ever get old. And they're so freaking cute. And so, like, it, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so strange. Like, whenever there's somebody and you've never watched what people fell in love with them for, you don't get it. And then when you see it, like, I remember, like, a Paul Newman, right? Older generations were like, oh, my God, Paul Newman, Paul Newman. I'm like, Newman, cool, whatever. You watch Paul Newman in The Hustler and you're like, oh. <gasps> Oh my God. Like he was so hot. He was so like just awesome. And so 
you know, when I, now when I watch and I see like people are obsessed with Matt LeBlanc, like I knew Matt LeBlanc, I've interviewed him. He's come to the house with his daughter and given us, you know, Girl Scout cookies. And, um, I never knew him for that. I, I knew him because of that. And, you know, you see little clips and stuff like it throughout my career in journalism, you know, we roll a clip, but I never watched to know, um, or Jennifer Aniston, like why people fell so in love with her. She's so adorable. And they were just yeah, such a good group. You hit the nail on the head with the two of them too. I feel like in order to really get Matt LeBlanc and Jennifer Aniston, you have to watch the show because they became like these heartthrobs. Yeah. And it's different when you watch them and see how they interact or like the, the Rachel haircut, you know, why is that so iconic? A lot of people had haircuts like that, but you watch the show and you're like, oh, it's the Rachel, it's the Rachel. Uh, yeah. So I do think Maria, you're right. It's the them. Yeah. So cool. And then you think about like, what if it wasn't them? Right. Yeah. Like what if some of the other casting choices happened? You know, you, you wonder how much is it them and how much is it the writing and how much is it the execution, right? Because the show was primed to be a hit. Like you, you can just tell that it, it probably could have been a hit without them, but at the same time, they are so integral, which is why they did so well. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it's definitely... I don't, um, I don't think you reach the level of popularity and the level that Friends got to without all the pieces falling into place the way they should. Yeah. Um, Breaking Bad, for instance, Jesse was a one-season, two-season character that became his own movie, El Camino, and everything like that. Like, I think the actors have so much to do with it, but the show will never be as successful as its potential without the actors, without the writing, without the stories. Everything has to come together in a way. Yeah. And, and Friends really did that. It defines a generation. I love it. Well, listen, anybody who's in the chat, and I see Brandy and um, Larry and so many people in there, um, they all say you have issues, Roxy. I'm just kidding. One, one true, person true. said you had an issue. Um, but if you guys have any questions for Kevin, before we get to that, I do have to mention, uh, we have the Good News uh, Movement founder on the show, Michelle, just last week, and we're going to be doing a fun little um partnership on the show that Jeff's putting together today. But I saw this and I thought this was the sweetest story ever. So uh, on April 19th, Marco's Pizza, which we have Marco's Pizza out here as well, was robbed. Not much was stolen because not much was there. According to the owner, instead of responding angrily, he replied with the above note to the community. The people who came and robbed me could have asked for food and would have gotten more value than what they were able to steal. So he created this post and it said, in the coming months, if you find yourself in a situation unable to put food on the table for your family, please stop by our store. There's no need to be shy or embarrassed. Just speak with the manager and quietly let us know you've seen this post. We'll make sure your family gets a meal. We are here because of all of our, oh my God, I'm going to cry. Shit. We're here because of our community, and these are very challenging times for all of us. We will do our best for as long as we can. I, this is in the colony, Texas. I thought this was so beyond special. Um, and, and when you get to see all of the people that are stepping up and doing things like this, you know, it's, it's so beautiful um, to see people helping each other. And I want to highlight that every week, and we're going to work with them to do that. I mean, we also um, are hopefully going to be getting Guy Fieri on. I'm going to be texting him and getting that to happen. He's raised over $20 million for people, and he has just hustled so hard um, to feed people. And so there are amazing people doing amazing things at this very critical time in our world, and um, they should be recognized, and we're going to be doing just that. Maria, when you see this post, do you think that you want to cry because you're surprised that humanity is doing this or just that you're grateful? What, what makes you want to cry because of this? Um, well, I, I cry because I feel sad for people that are suffering. And then I cry when I see the goodness in people coming to help them. Like, you know, we've all been in places where we've needed help. And so I understand that vulnerability and to know that people are stepping up 
and helping each other. It's, it's just, I don't know. It makes me so emotional all the time. Like after nine 11, even just people walking by and like, you know, saying hello to a stranger or hugging a stranger or anything that they did. Um, it's always moving to me. I don't know. No, I, th I think you do know. I think that's exactly what it is because I, I see something like this too. And I think that anybody who gives what they can is a beautiful thing. Not everybody has everything to give, but anybody who gives whatever they can is doing the right thing. And even uh, next to the note, there's a, a pizza in the shape of yeah. a heart. <laughs> and I, I just thought that that was so cute too, just going that extra mile for people and then trying to really make a difference with whatever you have. So I, I had a similar reaction when you told me about this this morning. Just, I think it's really beautiful and shout out to Marcos. Yeah. I just, uh, this morning I was like, I'm going to eat Marcos pizza all the time now. <laughs> and he's probably a franchise owner in, in Colony, Texas. And so it's like a one thing, but you know what? Maybe we do something nice for that owner. Maybe, um, maybe we get him on the show <clears throat> and honor him or I don't know, maybe we send him some flowers or something to like, just, you know, thank him for amazing. being a good human. I think that would be really cool. In the meantime, um, thank you guys for joining us here on Better Together. If you haven't become a member of Patreon, please do. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be having an amazing discussion on Brene Brown. If you've not heard of her, what rock are you sleeping under? Um, Brene Brown is, uh, ugh, she is incredible. And I've been listening to various uh, YouTube videos, her TED Talk on um, vulnerability and shame. And I realized, you know, everything that comes to you is coming to you at the right time and at the right moment. And I was like, hmm, really need to be focusing on exploring that more. I've really focused on, you know, Esther Hicks and asking it is given and I'm manifesting so many things and I'm focusing on what I'm grateful for at night and setting my intentions and all of that. And everything's in flow and clicking in that way. And so I'm like, shoot, I think I have to do some of this like deep kind of vulnerability work, which, you know, um, I definitely choose when I want to be vulnerable. <laughs> I don't know how you guys feel. It's, it's never been something I've enjoyed. Um, I've appreciated it in moments, but definitely is very scary. And so um, we're going to be talking about that on the show tomorrow. So if you haven't joined, please do. Um, we're grateful for your support. Um, and um, thank you for being here. And thank you for um, supporting us here every day. We started this to create a safe, sane place for us during the crisis and thought it was temporary. Um, but we're still here because there's still a crisis and uh it's been really nice to be here every day and have great conversations with people and continue our journey of getting better and uh yeah that's that any questions kidding <clears throat> no questions i'm not taking i any always questions. have questions for you i could pick your brain for a million hours maria um, Even that vulnerability i have to listen tomorrow because i I'm, oh. I'm so curious about that for you uh because to me, you're such an incredible host and you are able to be vulnerable when you need to, but you're also able to not make it about other people, uh, not make it about yourself and make it about other people and not be vulnerable in moments. So, so many questions. Uh, I can't wait for that episode. Thanks. Well, I feel like, um, you know, there's always work to be done. And I, you know, there was something she was saying about how she never wanted to kind of dip her toe in the public life because she was scared of what comes with it, which is criticism and, you know, um, all of that kind of nasty media. And I realized that I've always been too scared to go too far because I'm afraid of that moment, right? I'm afraid of that moment where you get so big where they just come for you and kill you because I don't feel like I have the gut for it. Um, so kind of hiding a little bit <laughs> and, and minimizing a little bit is, um, is, uh, a lot easier rather than really kind of, um, putting yourself out there, if that makes sense. Even though I do put myself out there, I do it in, in my kind of way. Like, like here we are, we're in our little like cove, right? I feel like safe here. <laughs> <laughs> like that even as you say that you like make yourself into a little yeah cave. 
But well, do you, you think just... there are pros and cons to that? Because I, I hear you that maybe stepping out is important, but also it, it's nice to feel safe. And I'm sure that in a crazy industry like this, you're already getting attacked left and right, Maria, not you specifically, but yeah. anybody at your level. You yeah. Know? And, and by the way, there are dualities to all of this because I am very open, but I feel like maybe I've, I've, the beatings that I have taken publicly along the way have been so hard for me and they've, they've kind of made the turtle retract back into the shell. So I'm like, Ugh, it's not safe out there. Um, so it'll be great because I want to go on the journey right alongside everybody and I want to really like face all of those things. So that'll be really cool. So join us for that. And and the last couple that we have done, I think have just been so freaking cool and Roxy, you will love them. Um, we did one on creativity, which was amazing. Um, we did one on, um, what was the other one before that, Jeff? Anxiety. Especially mm -hmm. right now. And then creating your own happiness was mm -hmm. the most recent one we did. And I did, um, we had that Swedish psychiatrist who I just booked for next week. So um, oh, we'll cool. be excited to have her, which will be great. Awesome. All right. Well, guys, I can't, uh, can't hold back any longer. <laughs> our uh our guest today like i said kevin bright is one of tv's most influential producer directors of multi-camera sitcoms he has directed over 60 episodes of nbc friends including the finale which still is the highest viewing highest viewed broadcast finale of this century i'm pretty sure i read the fact was 52 million viewers when i was reading my research last night he now mentors uh, up-and-comers via my alma mater, Emerson College. Kevin Bright, thank you so much for joining. Hey, Maria. How's it going? Great, thank you. How are you? Great, great. Um, I'm in uh, upstate New York, and uh, other than the fact it's very cold, uh, it's kind of quiet and uh, feels like a safe place to be. I love it. I um I have to tell you, I invited one of my favorite hosts, and um, she's been broadcasting for us at AfterBuzz TV and working with us for the last decade. And she quite possibly could be the biggest Friends fan on the planet. She's she's built the Lego kit. Uh -huh. She's got all the uh -huh. games. She's wearing her T-shirt right now. Um, uh -huh. Roxy Stryer is joining doing? us. <laughs> How you doing? Okay. That's right. But, you know, it was a hard pick this morning because I had an Unagi shirt. You know, I had a lot wow. of different shirts to choose from. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be here today with you and cannot wait to pick your brain on some things. Well, I heard you were going to be along and I have a surprise for you later also. So uh, um, we'll we'll reveal that as we go. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Okay. You know, actually, Roxy, you interviewed, was it... Um, David Crane. David Crane, yeah. That's right. Yeah, David Crane uh, for the Tomorrow Show. And uh, I'm I'm interested to see how your guys, what you say versus what he said, especially about the potential reunion down the pipeline. So, Well, the, well, the reunion is happening. It's not potential anymore. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, but to be clear about it, it's a reunion of the cast getting nostalgic about the show. It's not them uh, putting on the old characters and uh, doing a new version of Friends. So right. We keep hearing non-scripted, but I know that people try to twist that and wonder if non-scripted is improv or non-scripted is just conversation. We're going to be following them in their homes and invading their privacy. And, you know, I'm sure that's the special they'd like to make. So, no, Wait, it, so it, you it, guys are going to follow them to their homes? No, no. Oh. <laughs> there'll, be, there'll actually be a, li a little bit of that. Um, ben Winston, who is the terrific producer of the um, uh, late night show um, with James Corden, uh, he's producing this with us. And uh, so uh, he'll, he'll bring some surprises. So where are you guys at with it now with the coronavirus? We're just waiting. We're waiting for a window. Um, we feel the reunion needs to be done in front of an audience. Uh, we can't not share it after all this time. So uh, tentatively speaking, we're hoping that the special will be completed by Thanksgiving and uh, that 
uh, the show will be seen on HBO Max at that time. A Thanksgiving Friends reunion that would be amazing, and I'm sure you that be amazing. Yeah, so you're you're I'm sure going to be building in clips for them to look at and react to, and all of that. Is that a tough thing to pick? Well, um, I, I think what's tough about it is the clips have been picked over so much, so much over the years is I think coming up with a fresh approach, uh, to those clips and hopefully, uh, digging through the old dailies. You know, we have every piece of footage we ever shot on friends and yes. maybe seeing something that while the cameras were still rolling, uh, that the audience has never seen before, uh, an alternate take of uh, a scene that's known very well. So, uh, you know, th- those are the kind of things we're going to be looking for. Oh, my God. That'll even surprise them, which will be cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Wow. I think I saw that in Variety, you guys were talking about doing this live. However, if the coronavirus went on long enough that you might have to do a digital Zoom type version, a la Parks and Rec, or people have taken that path. Have you talked about yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, we're actually all on board for waiting it out. Well, we've waited this long. We really want to share it with an audience. Um, we want to do it without constrictions, uh, even though, as, as we all know, for the foreseeable future, I'm sure there will be some. But uh, we'd really like to get it in front of a studio audience again. So uh, we're waiting for the Warner Brothers lot to open up again, stage 24. Kevin, I wonder, you know, bringing them back to have that moment is so special because it's it's the most loved program. I mean, it, it's it's incredible what you guys did. And I just wonder why they don't want to do an actual, like, episode or huh. another, like, bring it back for a season or, like, why don't they want to do that? Well, it, it's not, it, it, let's not blame them. I, I think, uh, Marta and David and I may be the culprits in, in this one. Oh, uh, we got a I'm bone sorry. to pick with you guys uh, then. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, here's the thing, Maria. We made friends. It was about a time in people's lives when they're in their twenties and everything is so fresh and new in the world and exciting. And, So that's what Friends is about. It's not being in your 50s. It's not dealing with the kids. It's not being called to school. Um, It's not dealing with Zoom classes and learning that. That's not what Friends was. So um, I think one of the reasons why uh, it's remained so popular is is it is frozen in time. And uh, uh, we've just come to the point of feeling... It would be so much pressure if we came back, you know, it, 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 it's, it's leaving something that was very special alone. Uh, we want to be the ones who don't do the reboot. That's all. I have to say, Kevin, I think pressure is a privilege. Quote from one of my uh, amazing guests on the show, Trevor Moad. Uh, pressure is a privilege. And I would say that friends could morph and evolve, right? Like, as a, a, a new fan to the franchise, and as an old fan would say, it would be great to see where friends evolve or don't evolve, how they grow together, how they grow apart, how their lives have transformed. I mean, I think that, you know, whether it's fertility issues, divorces, all of these things, friends are always the constant, right? Right, right. Well, you know, uh, Rocks has the uh, Lego set. And uh, maybe that's the key to getting this whole thing on back. Uh, back on. See, there it is. <laughs> that's the key to getting the whole thing back on track. Let go, friends. They will forever be in their 20s. It solves everything. <laughs> I think and you just so- pitched the next Lego movie. There we go. <laughs> I mean, seriously. When you look back, are there things that you wish? I mean, it. it it's it's so perfect, but are are there moments where you're like, I wish we had done this? You know, we were really fortunate that I think that there was such a high commitment uh, to excellence on the set that we we never compromised in that way. Uh, if if we didn't get something right, 
we were more likely to um, go back, rewrite it and shoot it again than to just feel like, oh, that, that's going to be less than. So um, there was uh, a saying at the end of each show that, well, that one didn't suck. And uh, that was sort of our validation at the end of the evening that we could uh, live with the work we did that night. So uh, no, no regrets, no regrets, really. I did hear you say, uh, actually, in an interview with Emerson, so I love that you guys have that connection, but you yeah. were you were talking about how a lot of the shows that you've worked on, towards the end, you feel like they're kind of running out of juice. But with Friends, you didn't feel that way, and you actually commented that you feel like you could have done an 11th season. Was there anything that you specifically wanted to touch upon in another season of Friends? No, I, I, I don't. It, it wasn't about um, that. I felt there were still things we needed to say or accomplish that we hadn't done yet. I don't think it was about that. I, I think that um, uh, while we were doing that that tenth season, I remember Jennifer saying at the end while we were shooting one of the last episodes. I can't believe it went so quick, quickly. Why didn't we do more this year? And, you know, so uh, a lot of emotion went into making the decision about the last year and what was going to happen there. And I think uh, everybody had just wrapped their uh, head around, this is it, it's going to be over. Um, but, you know, in my heart, I feel like the show could have gone another one or two years. Yeah. Okay. So where would it have gone in those two years? If you were to share with us now, where were you thinking it could have gone? Well, um, Joey was not married. Something might've happened there and, uh, going forward. Uh huh. Monica and Chandler, are obviously Ross and Rachel are there. So, and Phoebe uh, was married too. So uh, that leaves Joey. So uh, I guess the other two years could have been Joey finding true love, maybe, or not. I've heard rumors that initially Joey and Monica were supposed to be the couple and that you guys ended up going with Monica and Chandler. Why? What happened along the way that made you change your mind? Um. There was a little bit of a sense that, you know, there was this, you know, opposites attract is a better way to go than with people who might have some things in common. Uh, now that may not seem obvious in terms of, uh, Joey and Monica, but let's face it, Joey liked food, right? Monica's a chef. <laughs> you know, that would be like kind of a match made in heaven, uh, too obvious. So, um, I, I, I think there was something about the sexual tension between Chandler and Monica, the humor, the awkwardness of it, the uh, secrecy of it. Uh, I remember when um, we discovered they were together for the first time in London. And uh, um, In London? In London, baby. And uh, uh, Matthew Perry brought down the covers, or actually Courtney came up from under the covers. Uh, after David Schwimmer had been in the room and revealed that the two of them were together. And that London crowd went on and on. It was just deafening the response to the two of them getting together. Uh, it was like their own children <laughs> had walked through the door. So um, you know, I'll always remember that one. Were, did you guys have, um, did you think that certain people had better chemistry with one another too? Yeah, uh, you know, the six of them together was the best chemi chemistry we have on the show. Everybody remembers the game show episode because it all happened in one room. And uh, you didn't need a lot of dressing. You didn't need a lot of sets. You just needed those six actors. I, I, I think uh, all of their chemistry was fantastic um, for... There was something very cute to me about Joey and Phoebe. Uh, I, I felt a little bit robbed that uh, Phoebe found Paul Rudd. Uh, I felt like Joey and Phoebe could have been uh, a great thing, but we never got there. Did you ever actually talk about putting them together 
at the end of the show? Mm, no, I, uh, we like what Paul Rudd brought to the show. Uh, so, uh, no regrets. Uh, like I said, I'm just saying that whenever Joey and Phoebe got together, it just felt kind of magical. There was something very, uh, um, provocative about it. it had a lot of potential. <laughs> they, they, they come from very spacious worlds. It would be so, hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. I wonder, um, was there a guest that you guys went after that you didn't get? You know, um, trying to think if there was somebody, uh, where it just didn't work out. Um, I vaguely remember being on the phone with Harvey Keitel and, uh, something that is not happening. But, uh, no, most of the time, you know, we really didn't have it in our heads. You know, we, of course we wanted to have, uh, stunt casting and, and big names for a certain parts. But uh, really, I have to say, people came to us. I'm sure. Uh, and, and told us they wanted to be on the show because their kids wanted them to be on the show. I mean, Sean Penn, I don't think it was his number one choice to be on Friends. But he wanted to make his kids happy. He knew he could do it. And uh, it ended up being fun. And Bruce Willis and uh, Julia Roberts and, you know, so many uh, incredible stars uh, we had the privilege to work with. Um Gary Oldham, I mean, you know, the list kind of goes on. But um, they, uh, the the other way that some of those stars came to us is, you know, the cast started doing feature films and they would work with, you know, Matthew Perry worked with Bruce Willis on the whole nine yards. And so Bruce would say, hey, I'd really love to come and uh, hang out on Friends for a week or so. So yeah. uh, that's, how, that's how a bunch of those things ended up happening. One of our um, chat questions is from Megan Lynn. She wants to know if there was ever a version where Joey and Rachel were going to end up together. Um, you know, what was the decision behind ending that relationship? Well, just the getting into that relationship was so difficult. It was very difficult. To, there, there, there was a um, momentary cast rebellion, I would say, on that one. Uh, they thought we might be damning Joey's character, that he would be, he knows how much, uh, uh, Ross really cares about Rachel and, and a friend doesn't do that no matter what his feelings are. You bury him. And so, um, what we did find and we were able to convince them is don't doubt the audience's commitment to Ross and Rachel. Uh, this is going to be exciting for a moment because it's going to be new, but they're going to realize during the course of this arc that you, that, uh, Rachel and Ross is still meant to be together. That's what it's really going to end up proving. So, uh, everybody relaxed and, uh, was, was a little bit nervous at first. Uh, Matt LeBlanc thought for sure the character is going to take heat. He's going to get letters. Um, but uh, fortunately, they never came, and uh, we had a lot of fun with uh, Joey and Rachel. So you've told me I'm not getting my scripted reunion that I need, so I have to pick your brain on this. Because... Well, well, hold on, hold on. I promised you a surprise, right? Now, you're a Netflix watcher, I, I, I suppose, right? So Yes, of course. You... So you've been robbed now. You're I've been no robbed. I have friends. been robbed. Yes. Are you going? Are you going to be subscribing to HBO Max? Is that what's in your plans? In the Absolutely, future? it's a must. It is a must. Okay. I thought that was going to be your answer. So, on behalf of Warner Brothers, we don't want you to wait. We are going to send you the Blu-ray box set for you to have at home. I'm sure you didn't throw out your Blu-ray player yet. Did no, you? I have not. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> It has your name on it over here. Okay. It's been so hard. <laughs> I've been buying individual episodes on YouTube. It's been such a challenge. No, get out that Blu-ray and get ready. Oh, oh my god, you are amazing! You just what literally made her cry. I love it. Oh, that this is what makes me cry. That's the thing. You're, Anything you know what? friends related? You're it's getting a little full clamp. Quarantine is a lonely time, guys. You need your friends. 
And oh, if you can't have your real clumps. friends next to you, you should at least have your 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 sitcom friends with you at all times. That's true. That's true. Okay, so what I was what I that's amazing. Uh, but I, I have to ask you about Ross and Rachel because if I'm not getting the scripted in the future, I need to know from you: Would they be together today? There was the will they, won't they? They did, and now today. Mm hmm. Well, here's the thing. Uh, from my point of view, if the friends were to get together today in their character, uh, just knowing the way the world goes, it would, I would not believe it if all of the marriages were still together. That would not be believable to me. So, um, I'm going to say that maybe Ross and Rachel might be on a break. Maybe oh. after, you know, because, uh, you know, now I'll, I'll, I'll borrow <laughs> through my own experiences, but you know, there's, there's nothing more glorious than to think when something is really over and you find out it's not. That's all. So, um, uh, I, I, I think that if we w if we did do it, it would be just too convenient that, and obviously the easiest person to, um, Eject from that probably that you could say that Phoebe got divorced and uh, um, that would just you know deliver the six of them and not uh, uh, and make it probably a little easier. But I don't know. It's always challenging, Ross and Rachel. There's something about them, you know. Yeah, I do know. If <laughs> if the cast, if friends had to live through the coronavirus, who would quarantine with each other? Oh, that would be funny. That would be really funny. Um, hmm. Well, whoever's quarantined with Chandler is, is, is definitely going to get ready for some kind of a breakdown, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. I think that they would be in the apartments just next to each other and trying to figure out the social distancing and everything. I don't know. I got together for the first time with two friends this weekend. Uh, we're um, sheltered, uh, shuttered up in uh, Saratoga Springs, and my friend has been in the Catskills uh, with his wife. They haven't seen anybody. They haven't seen their children. I said, come on. Come on over. You know, and they did, and they stayed the weekend, and, uh, you know, it really made me understand. It's great having my wife here. It's great having my son here um, and not being alone. But thinking about the people who are alone it makes me sad. Um, and uh, thinking about, hey, we haven't seen anybody. We haven't been exposed to anything. Come on. I need a hug. I know. I need a kid, <clears throat> you know, and and this is the scariest part of when when people talk, start uh, saying that you know things will never be the same again. Uh, we'll never shake hands again. Uh, we'll never hug again. And uh, I think that's too sad. So uh, while it may be a, a long break from that, uh, I, I think we will come up with the solution to this and uh, I, I, I hope that we'll get back to being human beings again the way we are naturally intuitively meant to be. I hope so too. All right. So the friends are quarantining together, socially distancing, masks and <laughs> yeah. gloves. Um, I, I think, uh, I think, gosh, I mean, it's, it's so fun to kind of think of all the, the hypotheticals and stuff. I feel like, you know, when you get to look at your career, Kevin, do you feel like, like just such fulfillment that you got to have kind of the greatest career you could possibly dream of with, with something like this? Oh, wow. I, I have been so privileged, you know, from the beginning of my career, uh, uh up until today. Um, I, I got in the early part of my career in my twenties, I, I got to work and, uh, meet incredible people. Uh, I got to produce, you know, 
Johnny Cash specials, uh, David Copperfield specials in my 20s. Dolly. Uh, and Dolly, yes. So, um, you know, all of those variety shows that I grew up loving so much, I got to do those. And uh, I was the third, uh, I shot the third American television show ever to be shot in mainland China, uh, David Copperfield special at the uh, Great Wall. Only uh, Big Bird and Bob Hope preceded us. Wow. Um, and so that was an incredible thrill. And uh, and then uh, transitioning out of uh, variety television and sitcoms and uh, uh, sketch comedy and uh, all the great people that I've worked with uh, doing stand-up shows. Uh, but uh, in particular, I mean, doing the pilot of In Living Color was a thrill. And... Uh, and then Dream On, and uh, Dream On uh, introduced me to Marta Kaufman and David Crane. And uh, then the three of us got together and did a little show called Print. If you had to pick your top three stars you've ever worked with in your life, your top three favorite stars, who would they be? Oh, wow. wow. In terms of like connection and in collaboration in terms of talent in terms of just like the full 360 view if i could make a choice to work with the three greatest who would it be okay well um I, i'm gonna rate them talent is included but they're, they're the people i've learned the, the most from so number one would definitely be david copperfield wow. um i learned so much from David and working with David. David is like working with Michael Jordan when you're in uh, show business. He's unrelenting. He's unmerciful. He wants it perfect and there's just no, nothing else he's going to settle for. So whether it's from the television production side of it or the actual magic side, uh, he really taught me a lot of discipline, uh, within tele uh, working in television. Um, and say the the other two people I have to put together is Martin Mull and Harry Shearer. Um, they really opened my eyes to uh, comedy was you know, not a one note thing and, and could take very many forms and uh, and uh, and approaches. And uh, those two guys really taught me about uh, comedy. And then uh, for friends. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna sit, have to say it's a, it's a tie for me with uh, David and Matt LeBlanc. Uh, David is somebody that I've connected with on many levels. We're on the, the board for the uh, Rape Foundation in LA together, and uh, every year we're, we're at the gala luncheon for for that organization. And uh, Matt LeBlanc has just been a, a friend throughout the years, and somebody that. Uh, I guess if you ask me which character I felt closest to, I would have to say Joey, figuratively and literally. So, so you were Joey. Like we we had a whole discussion earlier about who we all were. You would be Joey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I would be not quite as smart as Martin David. <laughs> Dead. I love it. Um, you know, you have um, you have had such an incredible career, and I wonder. You have a documentary, um, and I know you have a, a huge passion for animal welfare that you share with your wife, that I share with the two of you as well. So will you tell us a little bit about um, the series, Narungi? So for the last three years, I've been uh, uh, making a film about the dog meat trade in uh, Korea. And it's not just about the dog meat trade. It's about dog culture in Korea. And uh, it's called Nurangi, and uh, it was in the middle of going to festival when, when all of this happened. But the purpose of the film, it, it's not a film that I made to, you know, with a lot of hidden cameras and going in uh, clandestinely to film these horrible things to, to get people upset and, you know, uh, up in arms. It's really not about that. It's, it's getting an understanding of uh, where this culture comes from in Korea. It's over uh, 2,000 years old. 
uh, and uh, they're the sixth largest economy in the world. They're the third best educational system in the world. These are not unintelligent people, and uh, they haven't made the connection yet with dogs in terms of how close they are to us. And it's only been 30 years since dogs have been had as pets in Korea. Uh, prior to that, they were never pets. They were livestock. So uh, it's a country in transition. Only 30% of the country eats dog meat. Um, and uh, I, I, I think there is a, a wave of enlightenment coming forward. Uh, but uh, it needs understanding and respect. And that's what I've tried to do with this movie is uh, create a complete overview of what's going on in Korea with dogs. Uh, we even uh, see the national pride of Korea, the, the Jindo. We go to Jindo Island and see these incredible uh, indigenous dogs that come from there. But the only thing that troubles us after we, we visit that place is realizing that um, genetically they're just this much away from the dogs that they eat. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. 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 So it, it, it explains a lot. And I think, you know, the movie will give a lot of understanding and hopefully, uh, uh, allow the opportunity for the discussion to take place that will actually change things in Korea. And I have to say the, the, the beginning of it is, is, is in the government. Uh, there are no laws uh, in Korea which regulate the dog meat industry. There's no inspection. There's no uh, FDA uh, uh, inspecting dog meat before it's eaten by the public. Um, there's sort of just this a uh, strange understanding about its existence. And uh, in the film, you find out it's not officially legal and it's not officially illegal. Yeah. Um, it's very, it's a, it's a very complex thing. Is it similar um, to what's happening in Yulin? Um, no. Um, as opposed to what's happening in Yulin, which is, uh, I think completely about uh, small dog farms and um, um, worse conditions uh, for the animals, both in slaughter and in keeping. Um, the industrial dog farms of Korea are trying to move away from that and uh, and uh, treat the dogs more humanely. Uh, in in the old style dog farms, you may see up to five dogs in one cage stuffed into one cage. And in one of the industrial dog farms I went to, there was only one dog cage, and the cages were much bigger. So there's a way to conduct the business if it's going to be a business there um, in a more official way, but. There's over 10,000 dog farms in Korea. Oh my God. And, and only 2,000 of those 10,000 are registered to the government and are properly run. So, um, it's those 8,000 that, um, could be a beginning. Wow. And will the film be available in Korea as well so they can see it? Well, <laughs> How that, does that work? is the main. That's the main goal. That's the main prize, Maria, because as I said, I really didn't uh, make this film to try to get a lot of white people up in arms. That wasn't the goal of, of, of making this. It's really for the Korean people. There's a tremendous amount of misinformation, misunderstanding and confusion about the dog meat trade. 70% uh, of the country does not eat it. About 35% of the country would like to abolish it, abolish it. And the other 30% feel, even though they don't eat it, other people can have the right to. So, like I said, it's in transition. It's in transition. And so now that the world has kind of stopped in place and festivals are not really um, happening, what happens with the film? Well, um, right now we're waiting to see what's going to happen in the fall. I'm, I'm looking to the fall festivals and, um, uh, if 
nothing happens um, within the next six months, I'm probably going to stream it somehow yeah. and uh, get it out there any way I can because it's the most important part of this film is for it to be seen and for the discussion to be yeah. started. Uh, there's a lot of work to do. It's not a simple thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I um, I look forward to seeing it. Um, I've I have seen one on Yulin that was the most excruciating thing to watch. Yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. and yeah. it's really hard when you love dogs. But I also what I love about what you have done is you're also educating us on their culture. Like this is how they're raised. This is what they know. So you have to understand kind of how this all comes to be, you know, like we were great raised Greek and in our culture, they eat goats and they eat lambs and you eat Mm -hmm. everything Mm -hmm. inside. And to me growing up, it was gross because I'm growing up Greek American, but I watched my parents, you know, roasting lambs and pigs on a spit and I was horrified, but it is the culture and, you know, that culture can fade as, as generations fade. Um, Mm. and, and we have a chance to kind of make our own decisions about what we think is right and what we think isn't, but you know, it's, it's hard to just condemn people when they're raised that way. That's right. That's right. And, and, and if you condemn them, that you, you close the door on the possibility of change. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm hoping that this film will just start the discussion. Uh, this, a, a big discussion needs to be started in Korea. And I'm hoping that's what this will do. I love it. Um, any last question, questions, everybody, before we let Kevin go, who gave us so much of his time and, and, you know, Kev, I have to say, What you are doing with Emerson is so amazing. You are giving so much of your time and your talents and your gifts, and you care so much about these students. Um, I I, I think it's incredible. I don't don't know how much people are thinking about it out there, Maria, but it's not just Emerson. It's going to be all of our universities across the country. Students took out student loans, and parents had made plans to support those loans um, supplementally. But now with people out of work for such a long period of time, we, we have to be kidding ourselves to not understand those who were needing financial aid are going to need greater aid than ever before. And families are going to need help to meet their obligations this coming fall. So I hope that everybody will get behind the college. And, uh, and, and it's not going to be just the college. It's going to be all kinds of schools. But get behind the schools, support them during this period of time. They really need you. Kevin, I'm. But I have one. The last thing here. So um, uh, we have the uh, official Friends trivia book here, and I thought rather than a question for me, I have a question for Roxy. Ooh. Okay. Okay. So, what was Ross referring to when he told Joey, "15, your personal best." When <sighs> Ross said to Joey. Fifteen, your personal best. Marie, Roxy Marie is ex- expecting something dirty. Out of me. No <laughs> pressure, Roxy. Yes. No pressure. But if you fail this, and I, I said you were the greatest fan of all time, and you fail, I know we're gonna have a um, huge problem here. Uh, uh, if I want to. Like, I want to think it's some kind of a, <laughs> a a sexual thing with Joey. The fifteen, the personal best. But it feels like Golf? that's too, or a, or a sandwich thing. Fifteen, your personal You're getting best. closer. You're getting sandwich? Closer. Was it getting how warmer. many? Okay, sandwich. In the food group. Pizza, sandwich. Mm. Ah. Oh, what? what is it? How many Oreos Joey can put Oh, in my <laughs> God. It had to be sex or food. It had to be one of the two. Oh, yeah. my my heart breaks Do we give her right a, 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 a redemption question? Oh, no. I'm so bad with trivia. <laughs> I, okay. I, 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 you know what? I'm worse. <laughs> so so uh, we're on, a, uh, on an equal plane. Uh, well, no, this is a pretty good. I, I, this one you should get. What is Mon- Monica's biggest pet peeve? Like dirty, dirtiness. dirty things? 
her biggest pet peeve is when things aren't clear. Yeah, it's from the game show. It's from the game show. Monica's oh, biggest okay. Pet peeve. Um, hmm. When is it something that Chandler does? Doesn't pick up for himself. Doesn't flip uh, the toilet. Animal, animals dressed as humans. Humans. Uh, animals, animals dressed, dressed as, as humans. humans. <laughs> that is Monica's pet peeve. <laughs> you couldn't have asked me about Chandler's name on the magazines or anything with prom. Oh, biggest dress dressed as humans. All right. All right, that's question. good. It, it, we're going to see how, how how well you know deep behind the scenes. Was Matthew Perry in the bathtub scene naked or not? Till next time, Maria. We'll we'll, got, we'll have the answer tomorrow. It's a I good time to check out. Die. That's Wait, this is by the way. As you're producing your reunion, this is something you need to do with the cast, which you're probably going to do, right? <laughs> something like that especially <laughs> as courtney is just by the way can you believe courtney's just starting to watch the show it's pretty amazing you know she's been busy <laughs> <laughs> is she the only member of the show that hadn't seen it um it, to tell you the truth i heard that recently and that was news to me that she had never seen it before so um or didn't watch it as it was going along. I think everybody else has seen it. Got it. Yeah, I would assume that they had like, you know, cast nights where they would watch the show together or something. I thought there was too, but uh, we're both misinformed somehow. I die. I have, well, wait, I have a you asked me about bathtub behind the scenes. Can I ask you one more, <laughs> one more behind the scenes this question? This is so fun. Okay. I die. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I've always wondered what happened to Ben? There are fan theories that Ross lost custody or people have filled in the blanks. We lost him after season eight. And Cole Sprouse has said, my dad was an absentee parent. I mean, there's been so many things. But what happened to Ben? Um, I, you know, I haven't thought about that one. Hmm. What happened to Ben? Uh... Wow, well, know. We, we know what happened to the uh, the actor that played Ben. He went on to be uh, a star in his own right. So uh, um, I think he should write that story. It involves his character the most. I think he should have his version of that. So he just faded away. You guys weren't afraid to just fade him out and then not never discuss it. Well, remember he 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 did live with his his mother and her lesbian lover, and so um, you know I I think it was believable. He was in the show enough. It wasn't a show about kids, so no, I don't. I, we we didn't purposely eject him from the series. But he doesn't meet Emma. He doesn't show up to the London wedding. I mean. But nothing went wrong. You guys didn't have somebody a big hated Ben. Like Budget. Budgets, you know, <laughs> couldn't afford to bring Cole and his nanny and his, and his <laughs> twin brother. And, you know, it's a little bit much. I love it. it. We break news. Ben was too expensive. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Steven, there did you have something budget before budget. we let him go? Yeah, I had a really quick question. Um, sure. Because you're so tied in with Emerson, because you talked about so many these great opportunities you got in your 20s. Right now, a lot of the college students that I have like talked to are really worried about coronavirus and how they can find their way onto film sets when we start, you know, lowering it to skeleton crews to be able to get things done in Good quarantine. Point. How do you recommend new graduates actually get onto these sets in these PA positions and in these in these grip positions to get the experience to be able to be the next generation of Hollywood and producers and directors? Well, Here's what I think is the best use of this time. And, and in a, it's, believe it or not, it's actually a fortuitous time to be looking for work in television and be starting out. And here's my theory about why. Um, all of the great producers, directors, and writers, they're doing exactly what you and I are doing right now. They're talking to some friends on Zoom. They're sitting around. They don't have a lot to do. And if you know who your heroes are, if you know who the people are that you admire, now is your shot to try to make some contact and see if there's any way you can create contact with Maria's assistant's assistant or whoever you can make contact with. Start a conversation that when things start up again, 
you know, and they do start hiring people, they're going to remember these conversations that were had during this period of time. And that's all you can do because getting out onto the sets, literally the sets are not open. The studios are closed. So until uh, we work this out, however, you know, we'll start to work it out once it gets phased in, uh, that's when production will happen. So I think now is the time you want to try to meet people. Uh, people are engaging through social media in many different ways and uh, uh, contact the people whose shows you love and see if you can work on the next show. And add value, make, make it and add value. Yeah. You got to let them know why you should be the one. And it's not, you know, that you're the smartest in the room. It's going to be that you're going to work the hardest and help them at this critical time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I love so it. That, that's what, that's what everybody should be doing. If you, if, if you're sitting around being miserable, waiting for the studios to uh, open, you know, you should be on your computer, making contact, getting into chat rooms getting into groups and uh, getting into peer groups also because uh, you're not the only one that's stuck with plans and uh, in numbers, there's always better results. So, All right, Kevin, final question. As somebody who owns a broadcast network called AfterBuzz TV dedicated to after shows for your favorite TV shows, what is your favorite television show on air right now? Wow. Well... I'm going to say Rick and Morty <laughs> because we we really need our 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 things that make us happy and I think the show is just so inventive and, and fantastic and uh, I also want to give a shout out to my uh, nephew show Bo Bojack Horseman uh uh I I think are two really fun exciting challenging and interesting shows on television. I love it. Kevin Bright, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all of the fun conversation, the trivia. You totally killed Roxy. Her cred is gone. Well, I'll never sleep again. Her cred is Roxy, gone. And, and, and we'll figure out the address. We will figure out the address. <laughs> we will. Thank oh, you so much. I still get much. it even though I blew trivia. Oh. She doesn't deserve it! <laughs> <laughs> Stay healthy and safe, Kevin. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Maria. This was Good such luck. a joy. Thank luck you. Um, okay. That was way too much fun. Roxy, I love that you actually started crying. I almost cried because you were crying. I just can't believe that Kevin Bright gave me a Blu-ray set of friends. Like, I, I mean, if I... I it, I just I seven can't years believe old. That. No, I I can't believe it because you were seven. Seven. You, so I understand the deep rooted love, and obviously I know the connection with your mom, who you yeah. lost. You know, I don't know how many years ago was it now? Nine. Nine years ago. I was going to say ten, but um, almost. And in so August. there's a deep rooted connection because of her and her passing on the love of it to you. Well, if um, she knew that I, that first of all, if she knew that I was co-hosting your show today and that he was the guest on the show, I mean, she would lose her mind. <laughs> she would lose her mind. Uh, I, I can't even, like, if I called her and said that he gave me a, a Blu-ray set of friends, I think she, I mean, she would just, she would lose it. She would lose it. So I think so that's cool. part of why I cry. Just, to, it's crazy to think about what you do as a kid and then your adult life and, yeah, I'll I'll never stop kicking myself over trivia, but you know, now I know it's Oreos. He's naked in the bathroom. Was he you naked? Know. Did he say he we was naked? We don't know if he's naked or not. I I don't think he would have asked if he wasn't actually naked. I don't think he would have asked. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know wow. about that. But I will say, um, this was a lot of fun and Roxy, you really helped make it even more fun than it would have been. So thank you. Thank you um, for having me. This was great. Amazing thank you guys video. for joining us. Thanks for everybody joining us in the chat. Thank you for watching wherever you're watching Instagram live, Facebook live, YouTube. Um, and, uh, join us tomorrow. We are going to have intuitive and executive function coach, Judy Johnson. She is, um, someone that I've been, uh, corresponding with for almost a year now. She's kind of like a, a spiritual coach too. She's a, a parent coach. Um, she's just kind of amazing in all ways. And she is going to be on tomorrow 
uh, teaching us so much. Join us. Same time, same place, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, in the meantime, you can follow us at Maria Menounos, at Kevin, uh, no, at K Bright, E L A, at Roxy Stryer, at Jeff Crane Graham, at Stephen Lemieux Photo. My memory's serving me today. And remember, Woo-hoo. be nice people, make good choices, and be present. <laughs>